My objective this afternoon, um, in accordance with the assignment that April gave me, was to give a bit of an update on where we stand in particulate matter research as it relates to open lot dairies and cattle feed yards to a lesser extent. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it in two parts. Um, the first will be uh, a discussion of uh, some feed yard related uh, research that we're doing that has been uh, modified somewhat by the presence of El Nino conditions in the Texas High Plains. Uh, but then I want to share some findings uh, from a brief literature survey on the topic and uh, highlight some, uh, some ideas that I think uh, we're, we're going to need, need to be mindful, mindful certainly, certainly when Dr. Dr. Reynolds gets, gets up here uh, later this afternoon, we'll see the important relevance of his work to uh, hopefully the groundwork that I'm going to lay in the next few minutes. So some recent feed, feed yard work during the past couple of years, and I want to survey uh, the most recent literature on particulate matter and animal feeding. I want to put the feed yard work in historical context. Um, these are a variety of emission factors for particulate matter that have been found in the literature historically. For, uh, let's say, PM10 uh, emitted by cattle feed yards. And you can see a wide range of values published. Nearly all of this work has been associated with one single technique, and that is measuring point concentrations of dust downwind of the cattle feed yard, and then backing into an emission rate, or an emission flux, using dispersion model. When you see the acronym IDM, I'm going to use that as shorthand for inverse dispersion model. It's not, it's not a perfect, perfect term, term that gets, gets the point across. across. But the, the point, point here is, is that, that with a single method, method single technique, technique um, we, we get estimates, estimates of emission factors that span, uh, if you take into account all the literature, not just these, more than an, an order of magnitude, and that's, that's simply not acceptable. acceptable. So, so we need two things. things. Uh, we, we need a better central tendency. And, and we, we need independent, independent methods, methods that, that can be used to... Uh, we, we have, have no, no idea what the real numbers, numbers are. If we've only got one, one that we have, have, we have no, no idea what these numbers, numbers are real. So, so uh, that's, that's the motivation the for much of the more, more recent, recent research that we're, we're seeing in cattle feed yards. yards. Uh, uh, some of it will be immediately applicable to the dairy situation. But as we found a couple of years ago, the emission profiles and the concentration profiles downwind of cattle feed yards differ rather markedly from those downwind of, of dairies. So that's the context. Here's a, another candidate for an independent method that could be used uh, hopefully to validate or invalidate, as the case may be, the inverse dispersion modeling technique. This technique is really a glorified box model. It's known by its acronym IHF, Integrated Horizontal Flux. It's essentially a mass balance uh, through a box sitting on top of the source area. If we take that box model and slice it horizontally uh, so that we account for vertical uh, variations in both wind speed and direction, and particulate concentration, then this represents a, uh, a discretizing or a refinement of the box model that accounts for vertical variability. That is its major strength. The fact that it's a mass balancing uh, approach is also helpful to us for grounding other uh, results from other techniques. So this is uh, what we have been trying to do our well-traveled feed yard C in the Texas Panhandle, and unfortunately, as you'll see in some of the pictures, El Nino has had a thing or two to say about whether or not we get this data this far. This is what the down side of the feed yard looks like uh, in a schematic fashion. 
Um, let's, let's say you're, you're standing, standing in the field, field looking, looking at, at the downwind, downwind side. Uh, you're going, going to see distributed across the downwind boundary of the field yard uh, an array of six monitoring towers, each of which has a number of masts on it, which we're measuring wind speed and direction, temperature relative humidity, and particulate concentrations. These 50-foot towers, instead of having multiple masts, they have a single mast on the trolley. The trolley can be moved up and down to get a little bit finer resolution. Uh, we were unable to afford a 75-foot version of this, um, and it's probably just as well. The fixed data will probably do it nicely. In any case, what this array represents is a way of taking a vertical cross-section of the plume and of the wind speeds and directions. And all of that through a bunch of fancy mathematics can be integrated to give you a particular flux across that downward face. Um, so it's known as the integrated horizontal flux method. Um, this, this is what, is what it looks, looks like uh, during, during El Nino season, season uh, which, which has, uh, at least in the year 2014, made us big wheat farmers, big wheat harvesters, big wheat harvesters, big wheat harvesters rather than air quality, quality data, data collectors. But, but we're, we're looking, looking uh, towards, towards the, the west, west uh, down, the, the downwind boundary of the field yard that you can barely see over here to the, the left, left at a couple of towers. Uh, we're superimposing this study on uh, other, other projects, projects that are going on at the same location. Just a closer, closer look, we're, look, we're uh, using, using tape and tape and oscillating micro balances at ground level to, to um, as a point, point of reference, reference so, so that we can also do inverse dispersion along under, under the same conditions, conditions and uh, compare, compare the two, two techniques. techniques. This was the rainiest June in many years. We lost one of our 50 foot towers to either a twister or a downburst. Um, as I mentioned, uh, it's been mainly pigweed control, and with all these consistent rains, uh, the dust has not been there to sample. So we're hoping uh, this coming spring that we'll be able to. Uh, to do a great deal of work here. We, we did, did get, get uh, a few pieces, pieces of data, uh, and as you'll, you'll see over here on the, on the vertical, vertical axis, the PM10 emission factors that, that result from very, very sparse data sets come in generally in the range of 20 to 40. When we, um, when we look, look at the, the west side, the west half, half this is the, the east half, and it's just an average of the two. two. Um, all, all of these, these data, because, because they're, they're so sparse, it would be preferred that you don't write them home to mom about these particular numbers. But, but I will tell, tell you that these numbers, 20 to 60, uh, are, are more, more likely to, to be the case than earlier estimates, in my, my judgment, judgment anyway. Based, based on, on the research, research that's been going on elsewhere, uh, Australia, Australia, Canada, uh, and Kansas. Kansas. Uh, uh, just, just to put a fine point, point on the comparison between beef and dairy uh, emission, emission factors, factors. Uh, we, we really don't, don't have an emission factor in force, force anymore for the cattle feed section sector. sector. Um, here, here are the numbers, numbers that have been used, depending on which sources you're interested in. in. This, this range, range is, is simply too wide. Now, now uh, let, let me move into some, some recent research. research. This, this is, is basically a, uh, a literature, literature review. review. It's, it's not, not a systematic, systematic review, though, though I will refer to one of those in just a moment. It is, in, in, main, main, in the main, uh, uh, just a broad brush survey, survey of what, what kind, kind of work, work is being done, done what, what kind, kind of work is being published, published in relation to particular dairies and uh, to a lesser extent feeding lots. The message I'd like to get across uh, in the next couple of minutes is how remarkable 
the topical domains are in which most of this research is going on. I get it behind the eight ball, I get this because you can change metaphors. I put my nose to the grindstone, I think of emission factors and emission rates and emission fluxes as being the most important projects there are relating to particular matter from open mind systems. The literature says otherwise. The literature is more concerned about bioaerosols, health effects, and such as that, particularly in the last five years. So I want to show you some evidence of that. Um, again, this was not a systematic review, but I did go to multiple databases just to make sure I didn't miss any hugely important documents. I freely admit that I may have missed a few, but these are the databases. That I queried uh, just to give you a sense of what my search stream might look like trying to capture as much of this literature as possible. Just to hand two sets together, dry lot, open lot, dairy feed, feed lot, versus some fermentation dust or particular Number one out of roughly 40 markets that showed up over. Past uh, five years, ten, uh, since 2010 to 2011, I've been limited to bioaerosols. Dr. Lane was a prominent in that. Uh, Dr. Dr. Stephen Reynolds, who will follow me on uh, the podium, has been uh, involved in that. Several so others that are known to many of you here in the audience. The main, main bioaerosols that we're concerned with, with would be uh, inflammatory, inflammatory agents, endotoxins, so these uh, would, would not, not necessarily be characteristic of culturable or even viable aerosols, bioaerosols. They may just be fragments of dead ends, in any case they have some inflammatory, uh, causatory effect. Secondly, we see an uh, interesting body of literature related to microbial speciation and persistence of the microbes related to down receptors such as spinach arms or grapes. Third, and this was something that popped onto the radar that I was not expecting, this was the transmission of Endocrine activating compounds that have resulted uh, from what well, there are components of the aerosol from, from, from feedlots feed and carriers. As I said, bioaerosol related literature dominated uh, in terms of the percentage of the ARs found. Very important for us to be aware of that. Just to give you a couple of examples of what that literature looked look like. Here's some bacterial, bacterial sequencing, sequencing comparing Sonoma dairy to a Modesto dairy, one which is larger than the other now. Um, and, and the comparison, comparison another comparison within the same study was are the sequences found in the aerosols related at all to the sequences found in what we would have thought of the material be as the more. So <coughs> interesting <coughs> question. And it turned, turned out that the answer to that question, question was, uh, no, they, they don't appear to be the predominant airborne bacteria are not the bacteria, bacteria that are dominating in itself. So uh, there are some important conclusions waiting to, to be discovered in that body of work. work. Um, there did, did seem to be location with dependency, but when you only got N equals two locations, so we can't really say much about that. <clears throat> Suffice to say that the sequences were different uh, in the aerosols of these two different areas. Um, one of these areas was surrounded by other farmland. This is one that uh, Dr. Latham participated, participated in significantly at 10,000 at the open and freestall, open and freestall, freestall area, area. Uh, looking at <laughs> endotoxins and bacteria, bacteria and fungi. And fungi. Interestingly, here, um, fungi, and correct me if I'm getting this, this wrong, but endotoxin bacteria 
where we're the only two, two of those three that exhibited any significant variation in the downwind distance. Fungi seem to be present, present at roughly the same levels, levels whether you go upwind, immediately downwind, or far downwind. So, so we'll 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 that. that. Is that, that consistent? So, so uh, out about, about, about 200 meters, we get any down near. near uh, background, background concentrations, although they're still elevated with respect, with respect to up. But, but this, this is important, important work. work. Again, it, it focuses, focuses on some things that uh, endotoxin has always been, been as long as, as I've been looking at this, that's what, 15, 15 years. years. Um, endotoxin has been one of the bad boys, one of the bad boys routinely considered in relation to livestock and aerosol emissions. So, so I just I decided, decided to borrow a picture, picture from a great article, article uh, and show you the uh, impingers here that uh, our investigators, investigators located near the dairy farm. This is taken from, from their publication. Number, Number two, two on the list was not uh, emission or emission, or emission fluxes, fluxes either. either. It, it was an occupation of health. health. About 30% of the 40 articles uh, that, that I compiled for this review were concerned with occupational health in one, one form or another. Uh, uh, don't, don't be concerned yet yeah, yeah, that, that we're closing in on 100% because, because some of these articles dealt with both, both, both occupational health and uh, aerosols themselves. But, but here, here we're concerned, concerned about the pulmonary function of workers. workers. Some, some of these studies involved. Uh, in situ spirometry, in which you assess the, the uh, tidal volume of the, the forced, forced export, export, okay. excuse me, expiratory volume of the human lung in an occupational setting. Try to characterize it over long term for longitudinal studies, or you, you can do a cross shift, looking for cross shift, shift excuse me, cross shift, shift change as a result of the 8 hours on the job to 10 hours on the job. Uh, some, some of this, this occupational, occupational health work has been related to just a characterization of the particular nerve in, in the context of occupational health. health. Major, Major focus, focus on endotoxin. Uh, and then one, one of the, the what I would consider the, the, the flagship publications is, is one that you're going to want to ask, to ask uh, Dr. Dr. Mons about uh, either to today or subsequently. Major system that I believe in the EDM and the co authors published in 2013. I won't belabor that uh, systematic review except to say this that systematic reviews differ from, from uh, ordinary run of the mill literature reviews in the intensity of screening of various articles or relevance to a particular research question. So, so unlike, unlike what I'm doing, doing today, which I'm providing a survey of the literature and a systematic review, uh, you're really trying, trying to answer a very specific, specific question, and then, then you are surveying the literature and screening out, out in a systematic way those articles that, that do not bear specifically on that question. So, so it's a very uh, there, there are, are journals devoted, devoted to systematic reviews. There, there are very important contributions to the literature. There, there are international standards for conducting them. And, and they are the kinds of literature that uh, we're likely to see more and more of the fact that the frequency of these kinds of reviews is, is increasing. <coughs> A couple of highlights of that. Uh, it's published if you're interested in it in the Journal of Agro Medicine. Volume 18 from 2013. A number of different lung disorders um, are linked to endotoxin exposure within this. Again, this is a survey of a number of different articles. I think they ended up 30 some odd articles. The obstructive change that is obstructions in the lungs that are associated with the exposures that we're talking about were in the terms of the authors generally mild. Um, that that begs further for exposition, um, but, but compared, compared to other um, studies of this kind, the obstructive effects of these exposures within the lung were designated as general monitoring, Dr. Reynolds, and co authors surveyed the literature. 
I also noted this may be of, of interest to those of you who are closely related to the, the dairy industry, specifically the operational side of it, that car washing uh, seems to have a measurable effect on uh, the exposure uh, of workers to uh, bioaerosol specifically. Um, also, also, interestingly, when I, I used to use the term, term because, because I, I, I used to use the term tachyphylax because it just sounds like, like such a sexy word. word. It's, it's really, really not appropriate here, here but, but uh, if, if you've heard of tachyphylax, uh, when, when the drug, drug is administered, the body, body sometimes has an, uh, an immediate reaction, reaction that, that reduces the efficacy of that drug right away. Well, there's a similar effect that appears to happen in young children especially, especially those, those who grew up on the farm, farm they, they are, in a sense, desensitized to um, asthma-causing or asthma-inducing asthma asthma exposures as a result, as a result of having been exposed to those uh, allergens and, and, and inflammatory agents at an early age. age. In, in fact, in, in utero, utero effects have been determined. And so what this means is, is, is if, if you're, you're a baby that's waiting, waiting to be born, born you, want you want to be exposed to as much uh, fecal uh, dust as possible, possible so that you'll be inoculated. That's, that's a better, better term for it. It's not inoculated, I think. But, but uh, uh, I'm being a little bit facetious, but, but the point is, is uh, that, that it has this protective effect of early life exposure for the long-term adult life. Has been, been, been documented uh, to a significant degree. There's, There's also, also uh, emerging evidence, evidence that takes us beyond endotoxins. So, so once we solve the endotoxin thing, we, we won't have to put this entire body of literature to that. Not by a long shot. Number three on our list was finally my bread and butter. Uh, the concentration measures, uh, again, we, we see bioaerosols bio showing up. Importantly here as well, looking at the, the, the persistence of something like cow allergen to uh, determine, it, it, it serves more or less as a marker of whether or not the air uh, that is moving across a livestock facility is the same air that's showing up in homes uh, two or three miles down the end. I'll show you some data from that in just a moment. Uh, uh, so, so that's, that's related, related, that is related, related to dairy, dairy production. Uh, a lot, lot of work has been done on PM concentrations associated with feed yards. Uh, one, one or two, two new uh, articles on, on elemental, elemental concentrations in aerosols from, from the dairy environment that appears to be, again, looking for specific markers and, and the seasonality and uh, precipitation and uh, the dependence of those markers. And then, and then barn, barn concentrations, concentrations versus animal activity, animal activity in the dairy setting have also been published over the last five years. This is a look at, at, at uh, cow allergen persistence uh, across the horizontal axis. We've got two, two different, different graphs here. here. These, These are indoor measurements. These are outdoor measurements. measurements. This is from Williams et al. 2011. We're going, going across the that means near the dairy, dairy distal, distal, quite a ways from the dairy, as I recall, it's about three, three miles, miles, and then in the intermediate would be between the two. And, and you can, can see, see a pronounced distance effect, um, which is no doubt to do a great part, part to, uh, to atmospheric, atmospheric dispersion, dispersion, dispersion in the boundary layer. layer. Interesting, Interesting though, though to, to recall that that, that effect was not seen for fungi. Fungi. How do you pronounce that anyway? Is it fungi? Fungi? I'm going to go with fungi. It's easier to say. Ju et al. Uh, 2013, a freestyle dairy, uh, free dairy barn here in Washington State, found a pronounced seasonality for, for PM10. And they also found that TSP only was correlated with animal activity in the barns, not PM2.5, not PM5, Sally, or PM10. But TSP was the only one that was correlated at all, and its correlation with animal activity was weak, to say the least. So, interesting look at uh, the particulate emission dynamics in a freestall dairy barn uh, do not appear to be associated with animal activity to the extent they did in the Catholic Union setting. Notice the emission rates here. 
Uh, I have put them in terms of emission factors. These numbers are calculated from the articles. Um, they imply, the numbers in the articles imply uh, a range of 26 to 33 pounds of PM10 per thousand head per grade. If you'll recall, the range for cattle feed yards was 9 to 70. And at least according to the logic that I currently have adopted, dairy emission rates should be lower than those of cattle feed yards for, for a number of reasons that we've rehearsed in the past couple like years ago. Now, uh, I reserve the right at any time, time to disagree with, with myself, so this is one of those cases. cases. Uh, but, but notice anyhow that the implied emission uh, factors are were between 26, 26 and 33 pounds per thousand head per day in a free stall there. Important distinction. Global, well, well, this is a study of uh, some cattle feed yards in Kansas, Kansas under the direction of Dr. Dr. Ronaldo Geary and, and some colleagues there. there. Um, this, this is just overwhelming evidence that, that the part size distribution is heavily skewed towards coarse particles. particles. Um, these, these are fine particle ratios, ratios that's what I meant by FP, FP in the feed yard dust. Those ratios are less than those found in urban, urban and aerosols. And you can see all, all of this really means is, is that this is coarse, coarse, coarse material. Uh, one, one other thing that's worth noting here that uh, uh, that 20% moisture, moisture content, content is, is does a very, very critical, critical number for dust, dust control in uh, feedlots and probably dairies as well. <coughs> Dairy uh, BM emission rates by some colleagues, uh, one of whom will be involved with us this, uh, this spring in a wider study, not, not too much difference from this one. Notice that the emission factors that they infer from their two techniques, a uh, wide RS balance technique and an inverse dispersion modeling technique run alongside one another, their numbers come between 33 and 55 pounds per thousand head per day. And this is now an open lot plus free stall, so kind of hybrid. So I hope you're getting the picture here that the numbers that we have typically used in the past for uh, emission factors for cattle feed yards and dairies have been a bit low. Um, I'm, I'm not, not yet, yet ready to write home to mom. Problem to solve. The range is, is sufficient and tight. tight. But, but I do see plenty of evidence in the literature that the early estimates were too low. And as we refine the techniques and superimpose multiple independent techniques on one another, I expect the range to tighten up quite a bit. I'm about out of town, uh, out of town, out of time. A couple of quick conclusions. Significant attention is being paid within the literature, the current literature, the ongoing research to bioaerosols, uh, occupational health, and to some extent public health as well. Anytime you see something show up as an occupational hazard or a Supposed so occupational hazard, hazard. Uh, somebody, somebody is going to raise the question, question well, what does that have to do with public health? health? And the answer is, in many cases, well, well there's, there's more to do than that. There's never a one to one correspondence, but there are systematic, systematic reviews are increasing. increasing. Public, public exposure monitoring is becoming more and more point, uh, important. A number of bioactivity assays with related to things like endocrine activity, etc., are becoming prominent. And uh, new alternatives to the inverse dispersion, dispersion modeling technique for flux estimation. Shut up. Hope I'm on time.